Welcome to Ventec FM, a series of podcasts where we focus on various aspects of the coffee and vending world. Sounds fun, right? Alongside the suppliers, customers, and everyone else in between, we'll give a unique look at what we're about and what's truly important in an ever-changing and surprisingly interesting industry. Carbon neutrality refers to achieving net zero carbon dioxide emissions. This can be done by balancing emissions of carbon dioxide with its removal or by eliminating emissions from society. According to The Guardian, at least the fifth of the world's 2,000 largest public companies have now made some kind of net zero pledge to cancel out their carbon emissions. They are investing billions in clean energy, moving to electric vehicles, pledging to halt deforestation. Actor and environmentalist Leonardo DiCaprio says climate change is real. It's happening right now. It's the most urgent threat facing our entire species, and we need to work collectively together and stop procrastinating. If you haven't guessed it already, in today's episode, we're talking, taking a look at carbon zero. Have we just jumped on the bandwagon? Refreshment Systems have been a carbon zero company for almost 13 years now. Clearly, they haven't. I'm Jamie Cochran, National Sales Manager at Refreshment Systems, and today we're talking with one of RSL's longest serving employees, and let's face it, a bit of a legend, Head of Engineering, Steve Wright, aka Wrighty. Welcome along. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Engine's a fabulous place. I was lucky enough to go out there in 2013 to actually have a look at what we were doing. I was told that we were making a real good, pro- good impact and, and making some real good progress out there, uh, and I was invited to go and see it for myself, and it was absolutely amazing. It's, I mean... Apart from the fact it's an absolutely stunning place. Yeah. Uh, and it was probably the best place I've ever been, the best trip I've ever been on, that's for sure. Um, but it was very humbling and very emotional as well. Yeah. Kenya's one of these places where they're the haves and the have nots, but the have nots virtually have nothing. They don't yeah. have much, they have nothing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when we went to visit some of these people who we were, who were about to give stoves to, basically their only source of heating. Uh, in their houses for cooking and also for keeping warm was three stoves, uh, sorry, three stones sat on the floor in a triangle with a load of sticks and twigs in and amongst them. Yeah. Uh, and that's what they use for, for, for everything. And it was so inefficient from a point of view of they had to, got, had to go and collect the wood themselves or actually buy it themselves. Um, and the, the labour intensity of it was just ridiculous. Mostly done by women and children as well, um, yeah. which is again a bit of an eye-opener to be fair because this, these bales of wood weigh an absolute ton when they're bringing them back from the forest. And obviously the, there's lots of angles to it. The deforestation is a big deal yeah. uh, out there, as you could imagine, and chopping trees down just to quite literally take them straight back and burn them um, is, is not ideal by any stretch of the imagination. But the, the biggest issue with, with the stoves being in, in the houses was the fact that there's a hell of a lot of carbon monoxide coming off them. Yeah. And the, the death rate is absolutely ridiculous. Um, Purely from that alone, I mean, the death rate in Kenya is, for various reasons is, is fairly high. But, uh, you know, when this is a self-inflicted thing almost, yeah. it's, really quite, it's really quite frightening. Um, so, yeah, we went out there and had a look and see what was going on. And, and like I said, the impact that we have on these people's lives on a day-to-day basis is just massive. Yeah. So it must be heartbreaking to see that, obviously, we've got it in so many ways so easy over here. And- it, they, they don't have water in the huts, do they? they, they no, they, in, it, it's, it is a little bit heartbreaking to see at first until you actually get the head around the fact that they don't know any different. That's yeah. just the way they live in the villages and things like that. They are all extremely poor. Um, and, you know, we, we complain when our Netflix and Sky goes down and things <laughs> like that. Yeah. Proper first world problems with these guys. Yeah, like, yeah. as you say, they have no, no electricity, no water, no running water. It, it's actually quite scary, but as I say, they don't know any different. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really quite humbling. It really is when you see what how these people live, um, and, and the impact that we had on them was just incredible. Really. Yeah. So the, and, and and obviously what they've got what they had was was killing them as well. It wasn't it was making them ill. It was massive impact on the health as well as yeah the whole lifestyle. Oh, really. absolutely. You know the. The immediate impact that we have on these people is, is, you know, there's a reduction in two thirds of, of sort of wood use and therefore two thirds of, of carbon monoxide inside their houses. And bear in mind, the houses are probably no bigger than the, the office where I'm sitting now. In fact, in what case, quite a bit smaller than that. The impact is really quite frightening. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the fact that, you know, you, you're delivering, we actually delivered some stuff to some people while we were there in some of the villages. And the reaction that we got from it was just incredible. You know, you just see the smile on the faces and the realization that actually 
and this is no exaggeration, they actually might get to see their children grow up. Yeah. It's really quite, it's really quite scary. Uh, yeah. But again, so satisfying to see as well. Yeah, but the, a brilliant impact that's made. And 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 it's, it's then had a knock-on effect, hasn't it, to not just kind of uh, potentially living a bit longer or living longer. Um, it's helped the elderly. It's, it's all, I think some families have even been able to start their own businesses because it's, it's freed up so much more time for them to make a bit more money doing other things rather than just literally collecting wood all day and, and cooking all day. Yeah, that, that's right. There, there's there's lots of spin-offs from this. I mean, like I say, for whatever reason, the, the men folk go out to work and whilst they're at work, the ladies are working even harder, yeah. going chopping trees down. It's, it's been so strange and different for us all. It's, I, honestly, I can't stand... And I know I, I should embrace this. Somebody, uh, Zoom training, right? Somebody said, would you rather do it in, when we were all coming back out again? Somebody said, um, would you rather do it in person or would you do it on Zoom? And I know what your answer is going to be, Chris. And I said, no, I'd rather do it in person. And he went, well, why wouldn't you want to do it from home with a with, with, with webcam? And I said, <laughs> well, because you can't, it, it's, it's the, the getting the feeling in the room of how you're helping people. It's the quiet person at the back or the gobby person at the front who who, um, who, who is, C commanding the entire training. It's about organizing that room so that you leave no one behind. And that, you know, whether it be the quiet person in the back who's scared to ask, or the person at the front who's being loud because he, he or she doesn't want to give away what they don't know, you know, and they're actually yeah. sort of like putting up a front. That's great, that's wonderful. On the internet, you're just sitting there and sort of like, some people haven't even got the pictures on. Some people could be walking the dog. I wouldn't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Like, and they just, and every now and again, yeah, I'm still here. They're just, they're just, <laughs> and so I, I've, I felt like I couldn't help people as much as I could in the room. Even when I'm doing a keynote at a conference, I can walk off a stage and if there's 500 people in the room, the 10 people who really need my help, I mean, we, we've worked together, Jamie, you know that yeah. at one of them, Anybody who comes to one of my training days, I give them access to me 100% after that. Yes. Completely yeah. free of charge. You know, if yeah. you want to call me, if you want to email me, you should do so. I mean, anything over 15 minutes, you get one to one rate. But the, <laughs> yeah, I always but, put a timer on. <laughs> <laughs> Never slipping in, and we're off. Yeah, but but um, everybody can call me, everybody can email. I want to be able to help everybody. If you're at a conference, I, I say the same thing to 500 people as I do to 10 people in a bespoke workshop. I want to make sure that I can help as many people who want my help. As possible and it, you offer that over zoom and everybody just goes back to the life you know yeah. everybody goes and empties the washing machine yeah you know or, or, or lets the dog out but if you're at a conference people will come back and talk to you afterwards and it's just yeah you just like, can't, you can't every engage, time can you? Can't, and, and i've been watching people do concerts um and you know music concerts over the last uh 18 months and that we, we should make sure that music stays live it's it's yeah. wonderful and i feel terrible for anybody in that industry at the moment as well but it, you can watch a live video on YouTube of a band. and But it could be a recording, but it's still a live event. Yeah. But it's a recording. And that's what I feel about doing stuff on the internet. It can always be a recording, even when it's a little bit interactive. But with regards to training, live events, theatre, music, I think they should all be in the room at the same time and everybody yeah. should be enjoying them live. Yeah, well, you, you, can't, you can't replicate that, that atmosphere and that kind of... No. Whether it be whether it be a training course, whether it be a concert, or whatever, it's it's so much better live. Human sort of really struggles online with people being disparate as well. You yeah, know, it's it's just I'm not surprised everybody's been getting sort of down as 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 it's as it's gone on, because you just you can't you can't bounce the conversation around like you can when you're in the same room. Or something, yeah. you know? I mean, if we if I, I reckon if we weren't doing in this in, in the same room, the conversation we had before we went on, on there wouldn't have been anything like it was. You know? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm delighted to be here with you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great face to face, isn't it? Um, just kind of covered it off a little bit, but how does it compare to life before the pandemic? Um, well, the, the biggest problem I've got now, really, we was with my own business is that there's so many shortages of things so that people are actually firefighting the situation they've got rather than improving their people yeah so uh, back in the old days when um when, when, when things were what people are referring to at the moment as normal is uh you know <laughs> i i think um I, I think everybody had a plan and and the trouble is the plan sort of goes up in the air when 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 the unplanned happens 
What are the positives to come out of the pandemic? Um, I think the positives to come out of the pandemic lie in a, in a couple of camps. I think, um, we, you know, people are talking about the new normal. I don't, I don't, people talk about normal like it was a, ever a thing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Everything has had to evolve. You know, the business doesn't look like it did 18 months ago. That, that's just a fact. It, it, it doesn't, yeah. it looks completely different, but it evolved. I don't look like I did 18 months ago, you know, <laughs> mostly because of the rosé and the donuts. But, but, <laughs> but uh, and I've really got to work on that before I start hitting the live uh, keynote circuit again. <laughs> but, yeah. But, um, but yeah, going, referring to things as, is this the new normal? No, it, it's, it's not the new normal. It's just the way things are. There is no normal. There is only evolution. Business changes. Yeah. I, I was I, I was delighted to see how many people pivoted because um, I I genuinely didn't think this was going to take as long as it did. I, I don't maybe I was being unrealistic, but uh, but I was I I was surprised at how long it took for us to get some sense of normality. And I'm saying that yeah. out loud now. I know that a large percentage of the world aren't anywhere near normality. You know? yeah, yeah. But uh, just just. The things that we all take for granted and being able to do them, uh, that would be some sense of normal. But when it comes to business, we have to work out where the new direction is rather than the new normal is. Because yeah. we, that's, the di that's the direction you want to point yourself in. And, and I think people should be having meetings around tables with regards to what's good about the pandemic is, how has this worked in our favor? Instead of just sitting there stroking your beard and going, woe is me, how awful, you know? Yeah. And it, it's just like, what's the new direction for us? And how can we help people? I, at the beginning of sales training day, I, I always replace the word selling for helping because it changes the way that you, you approach situations yeah. and it changes the way you approach people. So if, if we change the word selling for helping, now that we've got to where we are, what is the best way for us to help our prospects and customers, and how best can we get that message over to them? Yeah, and I, and I think if you think like that, I, I think there, there, there is a positive for, for everybody out there because you either got a business or you haven't, and uh, and if you got a business, then people need your help, so you shouldn't let them down. Yeah, brilliant. That excellent. You kind of answer my next question, which was how do we go about getting back to normal? I mentioned before we, we and I did an article on, on, on this not so long ago I honestly think that it's going to be like a scene from the Hunger Games that, you, that scene where everybody pops up out of the water and, and has to run for the best weapon you know <laughs> yeah I just I, I just I just see the world opening up and customers all sitting there like and all the best customers are going to be rushed but yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you've how many you've had but I, I I'm just getting this um rolling um continuous sort of barrage of emails and phone calls and uh, and bad emails and bad phone calls yeah, you know and, yeah. and un unnecessary selling just because everybody's come back to work and the bosses have said right go and get them go and get them now don't you know don't worry about being polite or anything or, or being professional just go and yeah yeah, you know, and, and so they jump on them like the wounded zebra in the long grass and rip the throat out. And you're just like, just <laughs> stop. Do you know, this morning, one of my ladies in my office took a, a call, and I was surprised because I know the company that that um, that made the call, but they asked for me by name. She told them I was I was uh, wasn't available, and and the caller, it was a chap, the, the the man who called her, um, when he said I wasn't available, hung up on her, straight after. Wow. And and so and so it's just like is Chris available? No, he's not available right now. Not thanks for your time, goodbye, or anything. Just like ching, gone. On to the and next one. On to the next yeah. one, right? So, so the way you measure your business is the way you manage it, and the way you manage your business is the way you measure it. So, there, whoever was managing that salesperson was was measuring them in how many calls they were going to get and how many successful calls they were going to get, and they weren't measuring the perception or the taste that it left in anybody's mouth. Yeah. What? Well, just let's go and get this, and you know, it, it amazes me how some people manage their sales teams. And yeah, you know, <laughs> when I've been in offices before with tele sales teams where people have been made to to um to to stand on chairs if they're not being successful, you know, and yeah, uh, yeah. And, yeah. and 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 the sales director sort of like gives me a, a cheeky wink of look how in control I am, and I, I, you, you've got to wonder, you know, 
if altitude is so important about success, just put them on the next floor up. You know, I mean, just, yeah. just, what are they doing on chairs? These are grown people. Treat them like grown people. Someone said uh, before the before the pandemic, someone said to me, um, "I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at the opportunity of, of of monitoring my people when they work from home, right? Because I, I'm not I'm not 100 percent convinced. And this is before everybody had to work from home, right? Yeah. And uh, now, I understand some people have trackers on cars, and, and that's not a bad thing. You know, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, nobody ever checked a tracker report until they were worried about where the salesperson was. So, you know, if everybody's doing the job, th- those reports just yeah. sit there like as an insurance. But yes, yeah, so this chap said to me, what do you think the legality of, what do you think the legality is of putting cameras in the spare rooms of all the people who work for me so I can see when and when they're not working? <laughs> Like, really? I think it's frowned yeah. upon at least. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you're talking about you know being able to trust people working um, remotely. Right? And I said, here's the big problem with that: if you don't trust your team to work, and you don't trust your team to work that much, then and you monitor them that heavily, then the only people who can work for you are the people who are desperate for work because they can't get work anywhere else. And that means yeah. you're, you're struggling with salespeople who won't sell for you. <laughs> yeah. Treat them brilliantly and get great people. So it's reasonable for me. And I think, you know, sadly, there's going to be a lot of great people on the market in the, in the uh, next couple of months because um, just the, the way that some businesses are hanging on with the, with the fingertips at the moment. So that, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, so there's going to be some good people about, and I think that we should manage them properly and we should interview them properly and we should get people in the right places doing the right jobs because I think the UK is ready to bounce back and, and the world's ready yeah. to bounce back. It's just... Yeah, I agree. It's just... Uh, we, we, Management, you know my feelings on sales management. Yes, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I, I just, I, the sales people get a, a bad rap all the time from 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 the work they do. But you know, just like Tottenham over the weekend, somebody was telling those people to stand where they were standing. You know. <laughs> <laughs>
is proud to have um, a yeah, silver yeah. medal on Eco Vardis. Um, it keeps us motivated uh, yeah. to continue and improve business processes uh, for the future. Yeah, brilliant. It's, like I say, it's, it's a great accolade in my opinion. It's uh, Yeah, brilliant. Um, and what's changed or what's changing here at Bravalor in 2021, 2022? So um, 2020 and beginning of this year obviously gave us, like many businesses in the industry, time to reflect, yep. um, time to kind of uh, gather our thoughts and how we, as I mentioned, come out of the box um, and tackle the world when it comes back to normality. So it gave us the opportunity to crack on with a couple of um, uh, projects that were in the pipeline. Yeah, uh, We've got the launch of a new bean to cut machine um, in the not too distant future. Right. Maybe before Christmas, a, company, uh, a machine sorry, called the Espresso, right. which is uh, um, um, an entry level bean to cut machine, yep. high end domestic, low end commercial. Um, called the espresso, as I mentioned. Yeah. Um, we have looked at our Valero range and um, on all of the 13 amp machines, we've given them a, a, a facelift. Yeah. Um, we've not fixed anything that wasn't broken because um, the Valero range is, is renowned for its reliability. Yeah. yeah. But um, we've added touchscreen technology to it. Um, cool. In the coming months, probably by beginning of next year, there'll be the ability to um, add additional third party uh, devices. Um, uh -huh. Like contactless payment systems, yeah, yeah. obviously you have Coinmex and so on, yeah. um, telemetry devices, um, all using MDB protocol. So um, they look, um, they, they just look, you know, fantastic now yeah. you know, for an instant Excellent. machine, um, yeah. which there is still a large market. Uh, yeah, there is. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's happened. There's a new HWA3 water boiler uh, which we launched not too long ago. Um, so yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of things that we've been working on, and uh, there will be more to come. But I yeah. can't say too much. On that yeah. Point. Talk to me about MIA or MIA. What, MIA, you, micro is? injected air. So um, this is uh, fairly new for us. We've got two equipment, um, two products on, on, on our books which use this system. Um, we've got the Vitro M5 and the Vitro X1 MIA. Um, so MIA, micro injected air. And it's a way of um, providing fresh milk for uh, a Horeca style settings for um, end of counter units or breakfast servers in the hotels. Yeah. Anywhere where they want a really good quality cup of coffee. Right. With a nice fresh milk product. Um, but it comes with some unique points. Um, so micro injected air, it removes the, 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 the need to have a pressurized vessel inside the machine to create steam. Right. Okay. So I don't know if you know, but if you have a, a, a any traditional machine or any any system that's using steam to heat the milk and make it frothy, yeah, and it, you need this pressurized yeah, vessel yeah. That, that that needs to be tested, tested every, every year, year because yeah. you it has this PSSR test for the insurance assessor and one of your engineers will need to turn up and make it a pop of the valve on top of the vessel, yeah, um, which is a cost, a bit of a worry. Um, but we remove that, um, and because we we inject the air, we get two parts of the milk. So we get liquid milk and then foamed milk, as you would the traditional barista in a coffee shop would be making some foam and some liquid milk. Yeah, um, and we can then alter that to whatever recipes you want to put onto the machine. Yeah, so it's very very adaptable in in how much of each of those components you want. Yeah, but then what we found as we as we move forward with it is is We've taken it so that you don't actually have to heat the milk. And what that brings along you is then iced coffee drinks. Right, yeah. So we can, which are huge. We, 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 yeah, with the youngsters. a mark <laughs> at the minute. It is, it's, it's growing and growing and growing. I think they said that it was under the age of 25 years old. If you go into a coffee shop, 90% of the purchases are iced drinks. Yeah. Which is just huge. And that's just going to yeah. get more and more and more. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we can have that liquid milk and that foamed milk, not heated, pour it over some ice and you get some really nice iced coffee drinks. We can add some syrups in there and make some really nice, I don't know what they're called because I'm not young anymore. Frappuccinos. But frappuccinos, that yeah. sort of thing, or maybe <laughs> yeah. even some milkshakes if you wanted to go down that route. Yeah. And it's it's quite a great feature and it's really taken off in 
high-end offices where they really want to look after their staff or attract better staff. Yeah. Um, and well, keep the ones at the moment. It's very difficult to obtain staff, but they want to really look after people and keep up, keep yeah. hold of them. And that concept has proven really good in in in, in going to those locations. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So, and that's that's something that obviously taking away that pressurized vessel um, adds a massive safety element as well in terms of because there yes. was a situation wasn't there with a traditional coffee machine that exploded in in a supermarket, made a yeah, supermarket yeah, yeah. about ten years ago. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's um, it, it that's when the PSSR testing came in after that incident, which was yeah. quite nasty you know, because that. Even though it's a small vessel, the amount of pressure built up inside of it is yeah, quite yeah. devastating. Yeah. Um, so yes, I guess it's a um, it puts your mind to rest if you take yeah, that, yeah. that element away. Isn't yeah, it? and and also then eliminates costs from an insurance yes. perspective and yeah, all that kind of thing from annual servicing, etc. And um, and so how does it? Because obviously the old the old fashioned venturi system, which is the old way of heating milk without a boiler, is is yeah. a system of valves that just heats milk and and didn't get to very good temperatures in terms of heat, right. probably like 40, 45 degrees maximum kind of thing using heating blocks. This alternative, what kind of temperatures can you get with the milk? You can get up to uh, I, I, the temperature of the milk is always measured inside the machine. Yeah, and so and then what comes out of it is a little bit different because it cools down as it comes out. Yeah, and um, so if I be a bit more scientific about it, yeah, you can't put your finger in it and leave it. Yeah, it's that hot. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well you can have it cooler if you wanted it. If, if, yeah, when you're setting option, up the machine, yeah. but if it is just too hot to drink. Yeah, I think from a traditional point of view, the baristas will want it to be ready to drink as it's served. Yeah. But we've gone a little bit high because we're British and we all like a nice hot cup of coffee. Yeah. yeah. Or sometimes you don't. It, yeah. it depends. But the, it is settable within that machine. Yeah. And it's heated by a um, um, by a disc heater. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Two point three kilowatts is probably over engineered for uh, yeah for what it has to do. But that can give rapid heat, so it, it doesn't yeah. take forever to heat the milk up. <laughs> no, you're not waiting for, for for the milk side of it. Yeah. And it genuinely does produce that barista style. Obviously, if you've not got if, if you can't have a barista machine on a site, you've, you've not got a trained expert barista, it's it's a great alternative to be able to push a button. Absolutely. It, it, it's consistent. Yeah. So it is every, every press of the drink, you're getting that recipe that you want. Um, both of the machines that I mentioned earlier, I have a, a, what we call a variable group, which allows you to put different amounts of coffee into different recipes. Yeah. Whereas before you was fixed to either nine grams or 14 grams going yeah. into this. So you can have different recipes creating different drinks. Yeah. And then you get the barista quality milk with it. And yeah. you've got a consistency that is, it's every time you go and get a drink. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah, and that's, that's, that's something that, and, and that, that not the same technology, but there is similar technology out there. But what often happens is, is it becomes a huge cost. And I would argue that MIA, Mia is, is, well priced and and isn't kind of one of those where you think oh i can't really afford that it is it is affordable as well which is which is it, it, it is i mean I, I obviously i'm biased but it is really good quality but what we uh, what we do with the case of refreshment systems is you have the control to give your service to your customers rather than putting it over to a manufacturer's agent yeah that will then you we think that that removes some of your control of what you're going to give to your customers yeah so we allow you to yeah uh, to manage that yeah and it, it does it genuinely does sit well as because we buy from or we deal with various manufacturers and it does sit very well on a price yeah um, in my view Tell me about IFM. So IFMs uh, was developed in the last century. Um, yeah. and, I, and I'm proud of that because we're, we're kind of recognized as being pioneers. Yeah. Uh, my background was publishing. Yeah. And, and I kind of always thought to myself, by the time anyone picks up a magazine, it's out of date. Yeah. So like, especially if it's news. Articles, interviews, comments, that doesn't really make much difference. Yeah. A couple of weeks here and there. But 
a lot of it had new sections and it was really out, out of date. So we wanted to build something that was more immediate. So yeah. in 1999, we created this platform um, that delivered the news to people's desktops on a daily basis. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, 2021 now, 21 years ago, people didn't, not everybody had, I mean, it's hard to believe that people didn't have desktop internet access. They didn't have yeah. email access uh, on their desk. You know, on the desktop. Of course, everyone now has it on their phone. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I remember when uh, one of the tech guys was, was messing around with his phone and I went over to him, I said, oh, Jacob, Jacob, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm testing the site out on my phone. <laughs> I said, what do you mean you're testing it on your phone? He said, well, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can get it to deliver the, the content on a phone. And I said, really? I mean, you know, back then it was WAP. I mean, it wasn't, you know, yeah. that's what the technology was. Yeah. Anyway, he did it. And I said, oh, Jacob, I said, it's, it's clever, but no one's going to do that. <laughs> well, of course, they eat my words yeah. because, you know, looking at mobile devices, that's how people, you know, and tablets, that's how they primarily access the sites these days. Yeah. So the site was there primarily to do what I thought magazines couldn't, um, yeah. be sustainable. I've always thought that printing on paper and chopping down trees wasn't really the solution. Yeah. And also the fact that we had a, a more immediate way of delivering uh, news and information to people. Yeah. So it's a combination of a trade magazine um, and, and really uh, research and resources because we've done an awful lot of research and uh, surveys. And, yeah. and we like to create reports and try and keep people updated. What, what are the like, what are the trends that are going on within the sector? Yeah, it's, it is brilliant. It's such a great resource. It's kind of if you need something or you need to find something out, it's it's in there somewhere. <laughs> do you know what? I think the interesting thing is, is, of course, with magazines, you know, some people do. They have a whole collection of them, and they're there on their shelves. But you know, if you've read an article, you've read a piece of news, and you want to refer back to it. How do you ever find that blooming copy of yeah. that edition that was there? So yeah. that's the, the you know, I, I, I constantly use the search engine on our own site because, yeah. you know, memory's going a bit. And yeah. you know, I think, yeah. I know you wrote something about this. <laughs> now, well, now, who was it? Who, what did they say? Um, yeah. And boom, you know, you can go back 20 years and yeah. find something that somebody has said. Um, and interestingly, we've just written a piece about the whole sector over a 20-year period. And we've done one that was 10 years. And I was looking back at uh, an article that somebody had written, and it was about 20 years ago. And what he said still stood the test of time. Yeah. Um, and it was really interesting. You could just pull that up, reread it, and, and it transcended time. Yeah. I mean, what he was saying back then still sounded true today. Yeah. So wow. whilst we have advanced a hell of a lot, there are so many things that are exactly the same. Yeah. And I'm yeah. sure we'll come on to a, a few of the issues in, in the yeah, marketplace. Yeah. That uh, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um, and what changes are FM's companies, FM companies facing now? Well, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, well, it's actually all the R's: recognition, yeah. respect, recruitment, and retention. Um, reward, i.e., the lack of margins, the lack of profitability in some cases. Yeah, um, and the race to the bottom. Yeah. Um, so commoditization. So all the things beginning with R. They, <laughs> they they happened. They were there twenty years ago. Yeah. And I'm not sure we we've, we've actually solved all of them now either. Of course, we've created an awful lot of extra issues on ourselves. Um, yeah. I think that the way that we look at buildings um, and the built environment is 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 very much different. Um, yeah. You know, we used to look at buildings and think FM was about the building. Well, actually, we now really recognise it's actually about the well-being of the occupants of the building, yeah. not just about the bricks and mortar. Yes. Yeah. Of course, FMs are managing, you know, all the HVAC, the plant, and the equipment. Um, but really, we're there to support the occupants. Yeah. Um, so we've got that added um, complexity in terms of our, our workload, and also I think that where the real shift is happening nowadays is about sustainability. So, of course, FMs Absolutely. are managing waste, energy management, um, the use of plastics, the, the use of products that are harmful. So we've got this whole environmental um, aspect going on. And I think that's kind of summed up nowadays with companies that have to do reports on ESG, yep. environmental sustainability and governance. Yep. And of course, I think this is a big big area for, for FMs. I think we, you know, we're going to be very much more... Uh, leading the way, um, yeah. advising our clients as to you know the best 
policies um, yeah. in terms of, you know, that can be about waste management. It can be about energy usage. It can be about um, using better products and packaging. It can also be about, you know, the LED lights. And so I think to summarize that, one of the biggest issues that FM faces is that it's used to try and reduce the bottom line costs. And actually what FM should really be used for is to improve service quality yeah. and well-being of the building occupants. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we're starting to see that happen now, but historically that hasn't been the case. Is the technology required? Is, is, is the technology within this industry as important as we say it is. Um, obviously, from an RSL perspective, how would you kind of say, talk about that that innovation side and the technology side? Is, is that important, or is it just something that would that would be mentioned to try and sell a deal or whatever? Is no, I, I I think ultimately the um, when we talk about we talk about our niche, our passion, our pledge. I suppose ultimately it's it's our uniques, yeah, and how we how we drive those forwards and and when you look across almost every aspect e even across our core values innovation and technology is is peppered across everything that we do yeah um we don't want to stand still we, we want to drive innovation and new technologies and, and and embrace kind of automation um we want to we want to look at things from a completely different angle and we believe we do we have weekly management meetings and i'll be honest that that's probably makes up 60 70 percent of what we talk about is you know what's the next thing what's you know what are we doing next quarter what are we doing in quarter three quarter four what are we doing the next financial year what's our five five year plan um and that's not just about numbers that's not about sticking down kind of um, revenue growth or profit growth it, it is all about you know what's the next best thing what's the next big thing we can do as a business again going back to what we were talking about at the start we have no red tape so if we think something's a good idea collectively or maybe completely left field we just do it we, we scope it out as a project um and and if we believe it's the right thing to do we literally you know we have the management meetings on a friday and we, and we start that project on a monday it's as simple as that um so technology innovation is is, is crucial especially in the ever-changing world that, that we're in at the moment a lot of stuff has, has absolutely been accelerated over the last 18 months um with the pandemic um we we've accelerated our, our telemetry our visit on demand um we had that in the plan for 2024 um and we delivered that in november last year um, right. because we we saw that gap that space um that capacity to do it whilst we were in in the throes of a pandemic and our income levels were were, were kind of on the floor um and, and and we said well let's do it now yeah. Why not do it now? Yeah. Wow. Um, because that means we can accelerate um, all the, the visit on demand, the driving efficiencies, the reducing our carbon footprint quicker um, than, than what we already planned. Yeah. Yeah. So the pandemic allowed you to kind of commit more to, to that. Yeah, ab there. absolutely. And, and there's, there's a lot of other um, elements and projects and aspects that we've, we've delivered. Um, and, I, and I suppose there's a lot of stuff that we, because you get you get not run down, but you get bogged down in the, in the day to day run into the business, and you never really have that kind of headspace to to say, right, these projects are big. Let's get on and do with them. Get get on and do them, um, because you've got your Monday to Friday normal day to day interactions with with your customers, your partners, um, suppliers, manufacturers, so on and so forth, and you just never get round to those projects. So absolutely, over the last. 12 18 months we, we've delivered projects well ahead of time um and that's that's going to help us massively yes it's going to help us massively from driving efficiencies across our business reducing our carbon footprint naturally but also improving the customer customer relationship with ourselves as a business yeah yeah okay brilliant so i suppose one of my questions was going to be do, do people really need something that's different do people really need like the technology that, that that we often talk about do they actually need that and, and it seems evident that that, that actually they do because it, it it can improve their experience and it can improve everything they do and i know we're going to do some podcasts that are specifically geared around the telemetry and the technology but is 
would you say that that's fair to say that, that being unique and being a little bit different and doing stuff that's actually needed within the market from a technology point of view, is that what's going to drive us forward ahead of all our competitors? Yeah, one hundred percent, absolutely. It's um, you know, with, whether a customer, you know, a customer um, with a large manufacturing site, um, two three hundred um, members of team members on site on the workshop floor, um, you know, they just they just want a vendor machine, but actually they want a vendor machine that's full, clean, working. Um, the, the vendor machines. Um, I will major on vendor, vendor machines. The, there's the coffee machine element as well, but vendor machines. A lot of people, a lot of businesses and companies have them as 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 a service. So they should just really be kind of seen and not heard. Yeah. Um, and that's and that, and that's crucial to to a company who, who just want a vending machine for for the benefit of the team members on site. Um, and if we can have a machine that tells us when there's a problem with the machine, as opposed to a team member telling their head of procurement or their head of facilities that there's a problem with the machine, then absolutely there's there's a massive benefit there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's, there's there's huge amounts of value within this, and also on the coffee machine front, there's auto ordering. Um, so we've got telemetry on, on on our coffee machines now, which tell well, they don't even tell us; they tell the workshop um, that it needs coffee or it needs um, powdered milk or it needs hot chocolate because it's it's running low and it's it's gone through its kind of threshold. Um, levels of stock um, and then it just tells our warehouse that it wants more stock and it just gets sent out it's you know that's that again drives efficiencies and, and just takes those um those kind of th those requirements for for interaction or somebody to place an order or somebody to go and do a stock take or or whatever else it, it, we take that away yeah so time and money is, is yeah huge absolutely thing. yeah yeah brilliant um, and then we kind of talk me through the kind of the pledge passion kind of niche part of RSL. What I know it's something that we talk about within the business a, a, a little bit, but obviously to for anyone else that probably doesn't mean anything. Yeah, again, we've got we've, we've got a passion, we've got a niche and a pledge similar to, to um, a vision and a mission statement. Um, yeah, and so we talk about ridiculously creative solutions or awesome refreshments whenever. Um, or to continually pioneer innovative solutions, and and that they are, I suppose, for, I suppose for um, using general terms, they are our mission statements and our vision and, and everything else. But but again, we want, I suppose, want to be a little bit different. So there's a pledge, a niche, and a passion. Um, but again, underpinned across all all three of those is is technology and and kind of um, creative solutions and and pioneering innovation and um, you know. As I alluded to earlier, along with the values, we we we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years evidencing what we're doing there um, and how we can prove that we are actually delivering awesome refreshments whenever. Um, and and we're setting out a charter on that um, over the well at this moment in time, um, setting up short, medium, and long-term goals. So again, they're not just a statement; it's not just a set of words just put on. You know, a website or or a proposal or or the wall behind us. Um, you know, that's again a journey, and, and, and we need to live and breathe those those values and the, the, the passions and the pledges and the niches. Um, so everybody knows kind of what what we're about and who we are. Yeah. So it genuinely means something. It's not just words and senses and phrases. Absolutely. It's like it's, yeah. Absolutely means something. There's something behind it, which is which is great, and and it's it's refreshing from from my perspective. And. Um, so we're going to talk in a lot more detail on the series um, about various different things. Is it was one of the key elements that, that really sold RSL to me was the carbon zero. Um, been carbon zero for over ten years now. Probably if you bring the pandemic into it, it's about twelve years, isn't yep. it? Because obviously there's been a pause button pressed for quite a period. Um, but we're going to be doing separate series on there, on the technology and the telemetry as well. Um, so within the podcast series, we will be getting it more in depth into, into all these things and, and bringing in guests that can can bring their expertise into it. Um, with with kind of the next few weeks of, of podcasts that we're gonna that we're gonna be running, um, is there anything in there that you think is kind of re really unique to RSL that we need to kind of just talk about before we finish the podcast? No, I, 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 
I think I think I think carbon zero is is unique to us. We're, we're yeah. the only um, carbon zero vending business in the UK, and yeah. you know it's not. I know the environment and, and environment uh, environment and sustainability, climate change and everything else is, is has been kind of on the agenda, um, on the radar for a number of years now. But to say that we've been doing it for probably twelve years, probably a little bit more now. Um, you know, I think that's a testament to to us as a business, and again, coming back to our values, you know, responsibility and integrity. You know, we we want to do what's right. We know that we leave a footprint on the planet, um, yeah. and we want to do something about it. And, and I know you're going to go in, into into more detail on on another one of the podcasts on the, in the episode, but um, carbon zero offset is very important to us. But equally. Um, reducing our cof- uh, our carbon emissions um, as much as possible um, and setting out those plans and that journey over the coming years, you know, even up to five, six, seven years ahead, um, whether that's hydrogen or electric vehicles, depending on which way you go and, and which is actually more benef- beneficial to, to, the, to the planet and the climate. You know, those are the things that we're, we're scoped or we have been scoping out and we continue to scope out and reducing our um, energy um, consumption by 50 percent um, over a number of years um, but we took the decision a long time ago to do to, to, to offset our, our footprint um, through the carbon zero scheme um, and and that plays a big part um, like I said because using all this technology and innovation and vendor machines and vehicles on the road and um, you know feet walking the streets and, and so on and so forth it all puts a, a footprint on the planet and yeah and, and we need to be very mindful of that and and absolutely be proactive in doing something about it brilliant well that's pretty much all we've got time for today steve thank you thank you very much thank you jamie and um, but it does genuinely seem that, that rsl are, are, are a company that don't just say they're different they actually are different we are different and um, and that's really important these days if, if you want to believe what people say and there's, there's, there's lots to back that up at rsl Next time, everyone. This podcast has been brought to you by Refreshment Systems Limited, edited by Isaac Donio and Evan Church, produced by Steve May, host and writer Jamie Cochran, with special thanks to our guests. Yeah.